Hi everyone, Tom and Krista here at the Academy of Martial Arts. We are going to show you some basic self-defense moves that will be great for any situation. One of the key concepts of personal self-defense is simply situational awareness. Just being aware of your surroundings seeing that person who maybe looks a little out of sort. Situational awareness has different levels. The, the level that you would probably want to avoid most is code white, and that's where you are oblivious to your surroundings. That's just putting yourself in a situation where you may not catch something before it could happen. And so we want to avoid that. And code white, unfortunately, is where some people tend to stay, whether being distracted by their phone or a mom busy with kids. Uh, we need to make sure that we are always aware no matter what's going on around us. After Code White, you have Code Yellow. Code Yellow is a little bit of a heightened awareness. Uh, it's more just paying attention to your surroundings. Seeing the cars, seeing the people around you, making sure you know where exits are. Very easy things that you can just build into your daily habits that over time really could become very beneficial in any situation where you may need to use them. Next, you have Code Orange. Code orange, you're a little bit more aware, maybe a little uneasy feeling, uh, where you zero in maybe on one person who appears to be acting odd or strange or just makes you feel uncomfortable or a little bit threatened. Uh, so in a code orange situation, your heart rates up, um, you might become a little nervous. So in code orange, we want to make sure that we are really looking for exits, maybe drawing the attention to ourselves for bystanders that could be helpful. After code orange comes code red and black. And this is why during code orange, you really want to be making decisions and preparing for anything that might go wrong. Because once you hit code red or black, your fine motor skills are diminished. Um, you are really just acting on nature, second nature. And if you haven't practiced these moves, you're probably gonna go blank. You probably won't remember what to do or how to do anything. So if you ever find yourself in Code Orange, kind of run through a checklist of your, in your mind of, okay, I know this, this, and this. And that way your body is primed to then perform during Code Red and Black. Code red or black would be a fight or flight response. So you are being engaged by a perpetrator. You are being put in a situation where you feel like you needed to defend yourself. And these moves that we are going to be teaching you, they can be used in an orange slash red black situation where you may just have to show somebody that you are not willing to be touched or that they're crossing a line or it goes to the extremes where you feel like you need to defend yourself with every ounce of fight you've got in you. Most assaults, unfortunately, are done by non-stranger, as we would call them. So somebody that you know, somebody you may be familiar with. And they, by knowing you, let your guard down. But what you can do is right off the bat, if somebody crosses a line for your comfort level, is you can instantly let them know that you are not okay with that. And, and that can usually settle things. The key here is anytime somebody becomes an aggressor towards you, is to fight back. And, and you can scale your fight back based on who it is and what they are doing. So if somebody is simply just grabs you by the wrist, you don't want to go extreme, but you want to let them know that that's not okay and you won't tolerate it. So we have two different types of moves that we would classify as scalable and non-scalable. Um, a non-scalable move, that's when you have gouged somebody's eyes out or groin kick, things like that, where you're going 100% no matter what, and there will be physical consequences for the perpetrator. Scalable things, um, that's something that we would like to encourage you to use at the beginning if you're not sure of somebody's intentions and you just need to make a stand and let them know that they've crossed a line. Um, something like that would be you know, letting them know, don't touch me, or I need more space. Simple things like that. Um, when somebody grabs you by a wrist, you can do something very easily to escape, which would be a, a scalable option versus those other options which are non-scalable, such as striking them. When it comes to striking options, we do not teach our self-defense members how to strike with a closed fist. And this is because the risk of injury to you is much too high. Um, we teach striking with an open palm. 
Um, and and you, when you're striking with an open palm, it's, it's more of a high five to whatever part of the body that you are aiming at, ideally the face, because that's going to create some distance. And distance is your friend in any sort of situation like this. Now, we have paddles here that you can use, but at home you can practice with a pillow, um, anything soft that somebody could hold. The key with any palm strike is to strike through the target. You don't want to simply strike at the target. Um, your force is not going to be nearly as strong and the effect will not be what you need it to be. So when you're practicing, um, most right-handed people, you're going to have your right hand back, your right foot back, and you're going to keep your palm open. Now this is the strongest portion of your hand and you don't want to smack. That does not going to have the great effect that you need. You want to push through, okay? So my intention is for my palm to end up behind the target. And, and if this is somebody's face, that is going to push them backwards away from me, which is what we want. There is not a situation where I would be able to outstrike him, but if I can create a shock effect that distracts him for a moment or gets him away from me and lets him know that I am not allowing his intentions, that's the effect here. So once again, you, you chamber your arm, palm out, and you come back and you use these hips, that's our strongest portion of our body, and you go through the target. So I am not coming down, I'm not just hitting there, I am going through the target. And this would be equivocal to here. So it's not going to knock him out, it's not going to severely injure him or myself, but it could get a pretty clear message across. Now females, groin strikes is something that we often think would be great, would work really, really well. There's a few tricks to it and it might not always work. Um, so when you're kicking, again, your hips are your strongest body part. Um, it's not just a flimsy kick, okay? Uh, you really, just like the palm strike, you have to go through it. You have to go up as high as you can. And it's a matter of speed. Um, kicking quickly is going to generate more force. And, and so, again, any sort of soft object that you can practice with at home. And obviously the paddle's not going to be up here. It's, it's going to be about here. Um, and again, same kind of standing situation. And you'll see, we call this a fighting stance. You are much more stable on your feet when they are in this position versus here. So you always want to be in your fighting stance and it gives you the most power and balance. So when you go to kick somebody's groin, ideally it's in a situation where they've got their hands on you because then they're less likely to block and then if they do block, that means their hands are then off of you, which is what your goal is. Again, a groin strike is more of a distractor, a message saying, you cannot do this, I'm not okay with this. It will not incapacitate them entirely. So same with the palm strike. You're going to use that back leg and you're going to bring your knee up and see my knee is above the target and then I extend from there. Obviously it's a much faster motion in one, but my foot goes through here. I don't just punt it and I don't just kick right there. You want to kick all the way through. So knee up and then you extend the bottom half of your leg with this portion making contact with the target. Okay? Now, when there is an aggressor, a very common thing they may do is grab you. The last thing you want to do is go to a second location. So if you are grabbed by the wrist, at this point, you need to really think fight, okay? So you don't want them to pull you. They're probably going to be bigger and stronger than you. So you need to use your weight and your balance to your benefit. So when he grabs me, I don't want to go, okay? So if he really pulls, I have to do what's called base. You see my legs are spread wide, I'm low, and I am leaning into my weight with my hips and my legs. He's pulling. I cannot pull back. There's no way. And eventually he will pull me too strong and off my feet. So once you've established a base, 
my elbow needs to go towards him. I know you don't want to go near him. You think away, away. But in order to escape, there has to be a motion towards him. So my elbow is going to go in this pattern, and his grip will be released. So base, elbow. He cannot hold on. And at this point, there can be a palm strike or a groin strike, but you want distance. That's key. So anytime they've got a hold of you, you always want to get away. Base, elbow to him, okay? So if he grabs me, I cannot pull him. I cannot get my wrist out, okay? I have to go towards him. You can't pull away and try and bring your wrist to your shoulder. It's not going to work. You have to base and go in. But I'm still keeping my base. I'm still keeping my legs low and strong so that if he's pulling, it's harder for him to pull me and I still have better balance. As you can see, he's got full grip on my wrist. My elbow is gonna go in this direction. He cannot hold on. So what if he grabs me with his hand in the opposite direction? I'm still gonna base. I'm still gonna try this, but it didn't work. And so at this point, it's very easy. You just swing your arm back. His thumb is on the back side of my arm. His thumb cannot hold my entire arm. So you just find the weak point and swing. At this point, we're gonna show you what to do if somebody is choking you by the neck. Your options are non-scalable at this point. You're gonna fight with everything you've got because they've taken it to a level where your life is now endangered. So this can be done pinned to a wall or here freestanding. And it's, it's very easy. And again, the goal is to create space. You want space between you and anybody who may be trying to cause you harm. So as you can see, he's got my neck. Again, fighting stance, one leg in front of the other, whichever one you're more comfortable with. But if I'm this way, he can push me back so much easier than if I'm here. This also allows much more mobility. He's here, all I do is I put this arm up and I'm gonna high five over here. There's no bending, there's simple twist. His hands can't hold on when I twist, okay? I do not try and hit his hands, push them off, anything like that. Simple, here, and he cannot hold on. And this is where then you can throw a secondary strike to further create space and distract him. But if I'm here, straight onto him, I don't have as much movement, it works, but it's not as strong. So always fight in stance, arm up, and you're simply reaching over, you're not coming down, you keep that arm up and reach across. You're in trouble here. This has gotten to a level where, again, non-scalable options, you do whatever you need to do to make space, okay? You're in a very vulnerable position right here. I use one hand to push his face away, okay? The important thing about this arm is that it stays locked. You cannot bend or else he will have the force to move forward. It stays locked. And that's the most important thing you can remember. My thumb fits under his chin. And then fingers, they go in eyeballs, they go in ears, they go wherever you can put them, okay? But he is this locked arm. Okay, I am going to use his body to push my body back. So I take this leg, I put it in his hip crease, like right here, and I'm going to push myself back. And I get to a side, as you can see. I don't want to be flat on my back, I want to be to a side, because that's going to be less of a target for him and more stable for me. This arm, I get to my elbow. Okay, this arm is still locked because if he's trying to push forward, my arm is locked. Okay, and I'm using this foot to push from his hip. My goal is to get to my hand here and again, lock my arm. If I am locked out on both, both arms, his ability to come forward is very limited. Okay, again, using my foot on him, pushing back, even in his chest kicking his face, his chest, his stomach, his groin, anything to keep him away from me. 
while keeping my frame. So this position, as you can see, I'm a limited target from the side and I have a, a frame and I have attacks with kicks. So if he's still trying to push forward, I can kick him away and I have my frame. You can put this foot on him or on the floor, either one. I prefer on him because it keeps him away. This leg, I need to get behind this arm so that I create distance. If I come forward, he's going to be able to attack. So from here, framed arms, both arms locked, left foot on his hip. This right foot it has to go behind my right hand. So I come up and I'm here, still putting pressure on him with this foot, still locked out so he cannot come forward. And then here, and I'm away. Once you're here, you can kick to the head, you can groin stomp, anything to create space and disable him. So at this point, we're here, we have our frame. Both arms are locked. I need to get away, I need to make distance. This foot, your left foot, plant on the floor between his legs. That gives you a nice sturdy ground to push off on. Your right leg, you can go to your knee. You're still creating distance and you've still got your frame with your arms, and then you can stand up, and you still have your escape. Again, a bad situation. You need to get it out of this position as quickly as you possibly can. As you can see, he has me pinned and choked now. Life is in danger. You have to use your hips. Your hips are your strongest point. So we're gonna picture him as a tabletop. He has four legs, one, two, one, two. We have to immobilize one side completely. That way he is then off balance and can topple over. So we're gonna choose this arm going towards the camera so that you can see. So I am gonna take my left hand, I feed it through his two arms, and I'm going to take my right hand and clasp like this. What we're going to do is put enough force to collapse this arm to our chest. It just takes a simple, like this, okay? And you hold it here, you don't let go. The other thing I'm gonna do is take my right foot and I'm just gonna put it next to his foot. I'm not doing anything forceful there, it's just limiting his mobility when I go to topple him off balance. The next thing you're gonna do, and you want your feet close to your butt to do this one as best as possible, is you're just gonna lift your hips up. And that's going to create his head to come this way. Once my hips are up, I then turn to my side that I have immobilized him. And by doing that, we roll over and now he is on the bottom and I'm no longer in this position. So I'll show you. Hands clasped. Collapse this arm to your chest and hold tight. Pin his foot next to yours. Bump your hips up. See, he's off balance and then I roll to this side. And again, groin strike, palm strike, anything to get away and create space. So these are just some basic but very effective self-defense moves that you can practice at home with your child. You know, the wrist grabs work, same concept with a child as well as the front choke can work with your spouse or a friend. The more you practice something, the more your body will remember those moves. So if you do these one time, your body may be less likely to remember in that code red or black situation. So we encourage you to practice these several times. Remember the key to self-defense, and this is before anything even happens, is simply situational awareness. Being aware of your surroundings, exits, people, all of those things can make you a much safer person in general and better able to avoid any sort of situation where you may have to use something like this. It is empowering though to know that you have the skills to be able to defend yourself should you need to. The key with self-defense moves is not always strength. A lot of times the key is angles. Most assaults can be stopped if you fight. So we encourage you to fight with everything you have if a situation is arising where you feel uncomfortable and you think it may progress forward, call attention to yourself, scream, yell. Things like that can really help you 
prevent anything from progressing forward from there. Jiu-Jitsu as a sport for women is great because it eliminates the size difference when it comes to assaults. You understand angles and balance and, and how to use those to your benefit to protect yourself. We have classes here Monday through Thursday. Several women attend classes and it gives you this sense of power and, and strength and train Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs>